The New Orleans Saints have an enormous training camp battle on the way between Paulson Adebo and Alante Taylor for CB2, and it's clear who the number one winner in this situation will be. We got all that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into another episode of Locked on Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much, as always, for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to keep the conversation going one-on-one with me, you can head over today to joinsubtext.com slash locked on saints. And as always, I am your host, Ross Jackson at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, your New Orleans Saints expert credential member of the media, senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network, Sports Illustrated's fan nation site covering the New Orleans Saints. You'd also find me every single Tuesday on the Locked On NFL podcast and here with you every single Monday through Friday and then some on Locked On Saints. On today's episode of Locked On Saints, we're taking a look at the New Orleans Saints biggest training camp battle of the 2023 season. Paulson Adebo versus Alante Taylor competing for the right to be the second cornerback opposite Marshawn Lattimore. So we're going to take an individual look at both of these players as we get closer toward the end of today's show. We'll look at Alante Taylor and the thing that separates him from the, the, the pack or amongst the duo in terms of his consistent tenacity. We'll also take a look at Paulson Adebo's big play ability and the sort of risk reward that comes with it. But first, Let's just set the table here because there is a clear winner when it comes to this battle. And it's not Alante Taylor. It's not Paul Sinadibo. The winner of the CB2 battle for the New Orleans Saints are the New Orleans Saints themselves. This is an excellent, quote unquote, problem to have if you're an NFL franchise. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You have too many good cornerbacks. How sad for you. This is a fantastic scenario for the New Orleans Saints to be in. And it's where we sort of expected them to be after we got our first glimpse at Alante Taylor, who used to wear the number 27. Now he's rocking that number 21 here in New Orleans during the 2022 season when the Saints were dealing with a bunch of injuries at the cornerback spot. The way that the New Orleans Saints lose here is if they sort of rehash what happened last year. Remember last year, 2022, the Saints expected to start Marshawn Lattimore, Paul Sinadibo on the outside, Bradley Roby in the slot, and then at safety, Marcus May and Tyron Matthew. And none of those five players played a single snap together throughout the 2022 season. Not a one. And so now that's sort of the thing that you look at and go, okay, As long as that doesn't happen again, the New Orleans Saints should be in a better situation going into 2023, particularly with their secondary. And whether that means that Alante Taylor or Paul Sinadibo was the guy starting opposite Marshawn Lattimore doesn't really make as much of a difference as long as those players are playing to their utmost extent, right? To what it is that they can do best. Both of them are disruptive players. Both of them can make plays at the catch point. Paul Sinadibo last year with seven pass breakups, Alante Taylor with eight. Alante Taulor had a higher force incompletion percentage, but Paul Sinadibo gave up and was credited with five touchdowns being given up in his coverage by Pro Football Focus. These numbers are important, but the New Orleans Saints are not going to make this decision based upon what these players did in 2022 or in Paul Sinadibo's case, also what he did in 2021, his rookie season where he had three interceptions, you know, and, and, and played extremely well uh, in, in coverage. And they're not going to go back to the annuals of history to make this decision. They're going to pay attention to what is happening in front of them right now during training camp, which, by the way, is set to kick off officially on the 26th in terms of play, July 26th, excuse me, in terms of players being out on the field and participating in training camp. They will start on the 24th which would be veteran reporting, all that. 25th will be all the conditional stuff. And then the 26th of July, we are right back into the thick of it when training camp begins. So that's really the big date that you're going to be watching, as well as a couple of others that we'll discuss in some future episodes here. But for New Orleans, the other good thing about this, and, and really not necessarily the good thing about this, sorry, let me say that a different way. 
what you hope for when it comes to this battle is that someone wins it as opposed to one of the two losing it. Now, if that doesn't make sense, don't worry, I understand. Uh, I'm convoluted. But the idea, and this was something we discussed back in 20, before the 2021 season, when there was that battle between James Winston and Taysom Hill, was that you didn't want to see one of them lose the battle. You wanted to see one of them win the battle. And I think that's very likely to be the case when it comes to Paul Sadibo and Alante Taylor, because both of these players are incredibly talented. Both of them are super close to one another. Both of them are, are, are their games translate to the field. They make good plays at the catch point. They're physical. They can get you know, very physical in coverage. They're sticky in coverage. They do all of the things well that they're supposed to do on a consistent basis. And now really what you're looking for is, okay, is it going to be that one of them falls off and therefore the other one defaults into becoming the CB2? Or does one of them win that spot? And you definitely want the latter because these guys both have the capacity to push one another to becoming top flight cornerbacks one way or another. And we're going to leave out the idea here that, oh, well, just give Paulson Adebo the outside corner spot because Alante Taylor can play in the slot. There's two reasons why I say we're going to leave that alone and not have that conversation. The first of which is that we don't know that. No one knows that. Alante Taylor took his first snaps in the slot in any type of a camp, training environment, anything like that during many camps, during OTAs. It was not a situation to where the Saints looked at him and said, well, he fared so well on the slot, we're going to make him a slot cornerback. That's not even close to what the New Orleans Saints are saying. And so the estimation, which is all that it is, that Alante Taylor could play in the slot is one that is not founded in any evidence at all. So the Saints can't make that decision until they see it. If they decide that that's the route that they want to go, then they have to quickly get Alante Taylor up to speed in the slot. When he spoke to us uh, right after one of the OTA practices, he said it. I rolled it here on the show. He said, I'm making a lot of mistakes, but I'm learning it. And look, I'm an outside corner, but I'm happy to learn different things and do what it takes to help the team win because that's the kind of guy that Alante Taylor is. And to be real, Alante just kind of has that energy that tells you that no matter where you put him, he'll find a way to excel there. But that doesn't mean that you take him away from what he's done best based on a guess. We just simply don't know that. The second reason why you don't make a decision based on the idea that one of these corners could play in the slot is that you rob yourself of making the best decision on the outside. You have to be willing to make this decision if you are the New Orleans Saints. You can't sit around and be in a situation to where you say, well, let's just do this and then change this player, ask him to do something he's never done before. And then that way we get our 11 best players out on the field because is he still one of your 11 best players in that position? We don't know that yet. The Saints don't know that yet. They have to figure that out. So what these two guys are going to be doing is not battling for a nickel spot. They're battling for an outside corner spot. And that's what their focus is going to be when it comes to winning or potentially losing that spot. So let's take a look at what it is that separates the two of these players, because they do a lot of things well. They're sticky in coverage. They are really good in terms of physical man coverage, which is what you're asking them to do here in New Orleans. Not a lot of zone here in New Orleans. It's a lot of man coverage for those corners, so you have to be able to be out on an island. The thing that makes Paul Sinadibo different from Alante Taylor is the big play ability. Now, we saw Alante Taylor get closer and closer and closer to making big plays last year. The interceptions that you know, either were called back or the San Francisco 49ers one, which should have been interception, but wasn't ruled an interception, all those other things. But we've seen it from Paul Sinadipo. The issue is, or the concern around big playability, though, is that it comes with a lot of risk and reward. It's great when you can make the play, but what happens when you don't? And that's what has bitten uh, Paul Sinadipo in the took us a little bit too much over the course of the 2022 season. And so that's what you're watching for him to fix over training camp. Let's break that down a little bit further as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. The Major League Baseball season is now in full swing, and you're going to want to get in on the action today over at FanDuel. And the best way to do it, especially if you're a new customer, is to head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's going to enter you in your, or not even enter you in your chance. You're going to get it right off the bat. That no sweat first bet of up to $1,000. That's up to $1,000 in bonus bets that comes back to you if your first bet doesn't win, meaning there's no losing when it comes to your first bet 
over at FanDuel. So you can get in on Major League Baseball odds. You can get in on some early NFL odds, end of year awards, first week odds, whole bunch of stuff already out uh, over under right now set for uh, passing yards for uh, uh, Derek Carr, 4,000 and a half. You can go above or below that, see what you can win. And you can, of course, also check out the College World Series, LSU, surprising some folks so far, or, well, surprising folks outside of Louisiana, I guess. So you go to you go and check all that out, fanduel.com slash locked on for that no sweat first bet of up to $1,000. Once again, that is FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Thanks again, as always, for Locked on Saints, your first listen of the day every day. Hey, as we're going through this cornerback battle situation, I want to let you know, I'm going to start doing some film studies over for our subtext group. I can't do film studies with YouTube's terms of service. So if you want to get in on some of that with film breakdowns and all that, subtext is the way to do it. Uh, we're going to start doing those for all these position battles. So after the weekend, I'll have an Alante Taylor Paulson Adebo film study for you. So you can check that out by heading over to joinsubtext.com slash locked on saints. Two week trial, five bucks a month after that, if you want to stick around and if you decide that it's worth it for you. I'm hoping to find more ways to make sure that it is worth it for you. And it's a great way to help continue to support the show as well. So check that out. Join subtext.com slash locked on saints. Uh, we'll have uh, QA, not QA, sorry, we'll have um, a film study starting next week. So I appreciate y'all very much. Let's break down the um, big playability of Paulson Adebo. And that's really the thing that sets them, that sets him apart from. Alante Taylor is that we've seen the display of the big playability. I'm not saying that Alante Taylor can't make plays or that Alante Taylor doesn't make plays. We saw him with eight passes broken up last year. We saw him with a, it was like a 56 point something uh, passer rating allowed. He limited opposing quarterbacks quite a bit, but we haven't seen the interceptions from him just yet. We got three of those from Paulson Adebo back in 2021, along with an 8% forced incompletion percentage, four forced incompletions. Uh, as a part of that, but still allowed four touchdowns his rookie season. And remember too, that when you look at it and not even remember, but the big thing about, you know, Paulson Adebo right now is that, yeah, he can go out there and he can get you those interceptions, even though he didn't get any last year, uh, but he can make those plays. He can make plays on the ball, all that. But what happens when he doesn't? And that's where you start to see some of these big plays, the, you know, big plays over the top that he's, that he has kind of struggled with uh, a little bit during both of his two recent seasons. He was dealing with the injury last year. And I know a lot, there's a lot to chalk up to that injury. I think that he hears a lot of the noise that's kind of circling around his name right now as well, that Alante Taylor's coming for his job, all that. The guy has all the motivation that he needs and should be much healthier uh, going into this year's, uh, this year's season. And so hopefully that ends up making a difference for him. But the thing that you love about him is exactly what it is that made him a draft pick coming out of Stanford in the first place. And it's his ball skills. That, that's what it is. It's his ability to make plays at the catch point, to break up passes. Again, he had um, uh, 8% forcing completion percentage in 2021 with four forcing completions, according to Pro Football Focus. And then he also had a 12% uh, forced incompletion percentage in 2022, according to PFF, with seven pass breakups. But again, allowed uh, five touchdowns at a 100 123.6 passer rating. Now, like I mentioned, these numbers are good for context in terms of our conversation, but these numbers aren't necessarily going to be the things that the New Orleans Saints are looking at and saying, okay, we're making our decision based upon 2022 and 2021's production. Training camp is really the thing that's going to end up making the big difference. And the reason why I highlight that is because if we sit back and think, what catches people's eyes the most during training camp? It's big plays. It's why people... Uh, not necessarily players, not necessarily coaches, but it's one of the reasons why like media and fans fall in love with the Emmanuel Butlers of the world, but then they end up not making the roster. And so this is the big thing. It might be that the thing that separates Paulson and Ebo is his big playability, but will the big playability be the thing to lock him up as the CB2 for the New Orleans Saints? Do they see deficiencies elsewhere that make them more concerned about consistency, about the big play being let up? What happens when he can't make the play? Is he biting on double moves? Is he biting on fakes because he's trying to make plays on the ball? Things like that. So while the big plays stand out to us, the big plays might necessarily might not necessarily be the thing that lead the New Orleans Saints to making a decision in those big plays favor when it comes to Paulson Adebo. So it's got to be more than just the big plays. That's where things get a little bit tricky for Paulson. 
Now, what I will also mention is that we should consider Paul Sinadibo right now the favorite as the incumbent. He is the incumbent starter. He is the guy that has been the starter for the past two years. And that is something that the Saints will take into consideration, level of experience, what they've been able to do uh, during training camp, and then what can he show in terms of a consistent basis to be able to make those big plays, right? We saw Bradley Roby with, what, six, seven interceptions during uh, training camp last year, and then A, couldn't stay on the field in 2022, and then B, didn't have that type of play when he was out on the field as he was dealing with injuries and things like that. So that's why the big play ability of Paul Sinadibo, though it is the thing that should be his calling card, can't be the only thing that he rests his laurels on. So he's got to be able to show that physicality. He's got to be able to show the anticipation of not biting on double moves, of not losing deep, of not being uh, a player that is, is a little bit too overly aggressive and therefore gives up big plays while trying to make big plays, all those types of things. So he's got to show a nice balance in between sort of nuance fundamentals, all of these things, especially as a lone cover corner, because he'll be asked to be on an island quite a bit, but also show that he can still make those big plays without giving up big plays on the opposite side. So it is interesting that the thing that separates Paul Sinadibo the most, the big playability, might not be the thing that leads to the New Orleans Saints tapping him and saying, yeah, you're the guy. So um, this is where things get to can you win the battle as opposed to lose, or as opposed to the other guy losing the battle, right? You can have all of these sort of situations where you can show the big play, but then you're giving up the big play, and it's kind of this one for one trade in terms of what it is that you're allowing versus bringing in all of those things, and then still end up winning a role because Alante Taylor struggles or Alante Taylor deals with an injury or something like that. So this is where it becomes really, really important. You want to see these guys go out there and show polish. You want to see these guys go out there and show growth. And you want to see them go out there and show that they can be relied upon throughout the season. So the worst possible thing that can happen here for a Paul Sinadibo is that he loses this gig because of an injury. And that's why it was a little bit concerning to see him not present during some of voluntary OTAs. Made you wonder if it was an injury, made you wonder what was going on there, but he was out there during minicamp. So the big thing for Paul Sinadibo is going to be to show the thing that makes him special. The big playability, his ability to make plays at the catch point, his ball skills, all that stuff. He's a former wide receiver. So you want to see all of those things. However, he's going to have to balance that with solid technique, solid fundamentals, trustworthy, sticky coverage, and not biting to make the big play and then therefore giving up the big play in the wrong situation. Those are going to be the things that you're going to be watching throughout training camp. I think Paul Sinadibo has a little bit of a head start here and therefore has a better chance to win this battle. But that doesn't mean that Alante Taylor can't make up some ground. Because if there's one thing we know about Alante Taylor, it's speed and it's consistency. Those are two things that help to set him apart. So can he use that speed? Can he use that consistency to not only gain ground, but surpass Paul Sinadibo for CB2 during this year's training camp? We'll discuss how that could happen as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. Wrapping up today's episode of Locked on Saints, Alante Taylor, New Orleans Saints cornerback, has every tool he needs to steal that cornerback two spot opposite Marshawn Lattimore right out from under Paulson Adebo. And here's how he can do it. Consistency. That's really the thing that he has to show. Consistency and health. And we saw that from him throughout the end of the 2022 season when he got his opportunities. Uh, Only appeared in 11 games, but boy, were they a spicy 11 games. A 45.3 reception percentage allowed. That is spectacular. Targeted 64 times. He was targeted a ton throughout that season. You also saw him come up with a 19% forcing completion percentage, which led the New Orleans Saints in eight pass breakups, which also led the New Orleans Saints with no touchdowns surrendered. I mentioned the NFL passer rating that he surrendered earlier on. I apologize. It was not 56 point something percent. It was 58 point something percent, 58.3 as a whole. So you saw a really, really phenomenal season from a rookie cornerback Alante Taylor. And if you want to take a look at his standing across the NFL, he was one of the best cornerbacks last year in the league. Uh, In his 11 games, 
in amongst all corners that played at least 300 coverage snaps. Alante Taylor himself at 371. Alante Taylor was number one, numero uno in uh, reception percentage allowed. He forced the lowest reception percentage across all of those corners. And I just want to make sure I get the uh, right amount of corners, uh, 90, 90 them things. And that's where you saw uh, a guy like Alante Taylor really stand out. So that's that 45.3% um, uh, uh, completion percentage allowed. And just to be clear, that was better than uh, Sauce Gardner, who won Defensive Rookie of the Year at 45.9% uh, allowed. The other thing to take a look at is where that NFL passer rating, 58.3, ended up landing. That is number four amongst that same group of 90 cornerbacks. And just to make sure that you understand here, Paulson Adebo uh, was 88 out of 90 when it came to the uh, passer rating. And then in the reception percentage uh, category, he is... Uh, 66th out of 90. Now, again, these numbers don't tell the entire story. It will be training camp and all those other things. But I'm using this to illustrate why people are so excited about Alante Taylor. Because while Paul Sanadibo is the incumbent guy, while he is the veteran, while he does come into his third year of NFL experience, all of that completely understanding, uh, all of that to be completely understood for sure, he is still kind of trailing behind based upon the way that folks look at play from last year. So training camp is going to be really important. So the reason why I highlight these numbers isn't just to make it about, oh, here's what they did in 2022. It's can Alante Taylor continue that? Can he continue to show the things that you saw on the field against some top competition, by the way, DeAndre Hopkins, uh, uh, Devontae Adams, and more. I mean, the guy lined up against wild good uh, cornerbacks last season, or excuse me, wide receivers last season and made some big plays. And so it's that consistency that you saw throughout those 11 games. Every single game, there was an Alante Taylor moment, whether it was a pass breakup, whether it was a big tackle. And that was one of the things that uh, Paul Sinadibo does really well as well. He's good in run support. He's great. He's a great tackler on the outside, whether it's a screen or you know all those types of plays that could potentially get, get out to the flats. Both of these guys incredibly good in that in that piece. So don't forget that that becomes a part of what will help to make this decision as well. It's super sexy to look at these percentages and numbers and passer ratings and all this other stuff. But what can you do to help support the run game? What can you do to help support the front seven? What can you do that's more than just coverage? And that's where another place that these guys have the ability to uh, separate themselves from one another. But there was always every single game that moment for Alante Taylor during those um uh, during that second half of the season when he was out there. And during that second half of the season when he was out there, the Saints defense was among the best in the NFL, top five in a bunch of different metrics, including DVOA, as well as EPA per play, all of these other things. That was a turning point for them that second half of the season. And Alante Taylor was a part of that. Alante Taylor was also a big part of, along with Paulson and Debo, because the both of them kind of rotated out uh, toward the end of the season. But once Marshall Lattimore came back, but the last eight games, they allowed, what, no more than 20 points? First time they did it since the Dome Patrol was out on the field? And so you have to consider the change of energy that comes with these players. You have to consider the change in tenacity that comes with these players. And that's who Alante Taylor is. He is a tenacious player. And the speed. The speed is the other thing that absolutely sets him apart. It's really funny. You look back at some of the uh, like NFL.com um, uh, scouting reports for players as they come into the NFL as they go through the combine and things like that. And you always find these little nuggets. Like there's the one that's still hanging out there around Michael Thomas. That's like, hasn't, doesn't have a full grasp of the whole route running thing or whatever. And you're like, okay, this dude turned out to be one of the best route runners in the NFL. Well, you look at uh, Paul Sadebo's and his is one that highlights him as a developmental player, but somebody that could develop into a starter or, or a solid backup that can develop into a starter. And now here he is right on the cusp of exactly that. His, uh, NFL comparison on NFL.com is a guy that he's now teammates with in Isaac Yadam. And that was because they thought Alante Taylor would be really not much more than a special teams player or a depth player in the NFL. And now you're seeing both of those guys, Alante Taylor and Isaac Yadam, uh, performing extremely well in this New Orleans Saints defense. And a big part of why Alante does so well is that he trusts his speed. He knows he's not the biggest guy. Um, Paul Sadebo, six foot one. You've got Alante Taylor at five foot eleven. You've got Paul Sadebo with nearly, I think it's nearly a seventy-eight, maybe nearly a yeah, nearly a seventy-eight inch wingspan. The dude has long arms, 
And then you've got Paul Sinadibo, excuse me, Alante Taylor, who's right around 76 inches or so, 74 inches or so. So these are guys that are pushing these metrics where you can easily look at each one and say, okay, they're built like NFL corners. They look like NFL corners, but boy, does Paul Sinadibo have the size. But look at the division now. There's no more Julio Jones. Mike Evans isn't who he used to be. The uh, Carolina Panthers don't have you know these big, imposing wide receivers. There is Drake London in the division now, I guess. But you don't really necessarily have to have the big physical corners, the six foot one, six foot two corners in this NFC South anymore. Now you need the guys that can guard the Chris Godwins of the world, the guys that can guard the shiftier players of the world. You have to be ready for that now. And especially now you've also got Adam Thielen in the division, all that, these craftier wide receivers. You need the athletic crafty guys. So it could be too that the change at the wide receiver position across the NFC South, and really what I'll be honest with is the weakening of the NFC South's wide receivers over the course of the past couple of off seasons lends itself to a guy like Alante Taylor who can trust his speed, who can be consistent, and who has that sort of tenacious energy, that pit bull, that dog energy that doesn't allow him to ever give up or feel like he's not a part of a play, that all allows him to potentially become the mold for cornerbacks in the NFC. And that's where things get even more interesting. How does the change around the division at wide receiver impact the Saints' decision-making process at cornerback? And that could actually work in Alante Taylor's favor as opposed to Paul Sanadibos, because Paul Sanadibos is the quintessential NFC South uh, cornerback when it came to guys that were big and physical and all these other things. But now that you're starting to get to the shiftier, craftier guys, does that actually, does that door start to swing the other way in favor of Alante Taylor? So it's an interesting additional piece of the conversation that really like these guys have no control over, right? I mean, it's just, what does the rest of the division look like? And how do the New Orleans Saints respond to that when they look at their ability to build a roster and build a team? So there are so many different metrics to all of this. Who's going to make the big plays? Who's going to be most consistent? Who's going to be able to show what they could do outside of just the coverage game in run support, uh, rushing the passer even when called upon, whatever it might be, making plays uh, down in the flat, stuff like that. Um, who's going to be the more solid tackler, which is going to be tough to figure out during training camp, but you might get a look at during preseason. And how does the change at wide receiver across the NFC South impact the New Orleans Saints decision making here? And then the last thing is, does Alante Taylor just blow up in the slot. Because if he blows up in the slot, then this becomes a really easy decision. You have all three of these guys, Marshall Lattimore, Paulson, Adebo, and Alante Taylor on the field at the same time. But until we see that, we can't assume that. Because again, we've not really ever seen Alante Taylor play in the slot before. Yes, they tried it out a little bit during OTAs and minicants, but you can even listen to Alante Taylor and, and understand how that process is going so far. Not to say that it's going poorly, but certainly not to, but certainly there's no way that we could say it's so successful that that's guaranteed to be what the New Orleans Saints do with Alante Taylor. That's just foolish. And so when we look at where the Saints are, they have a big time decision to make. But the good news for New Orleans, as we stated to open the show, is that no matter what, they're the winners in this situation. Because whether it's Marshawn Lattimore and Paul Sanadibo or Marshawn Lattimore and Alante Taylor, if those guys stay healthy, the Saints are in a fantastic situation at one of the most important position groups in the NFL at outside corner, the perimeter corner, especially, especially in a scheme like Dennis Allen's, which requires man coverage, guys to be alone on an island, all those other things. Whoo, boy, I am so excited to see this battle. If you want more on this, join subtext.com slash locked on Saints. Have a film study out for you after the weekend, looking at both these guys' games, going up against similar receivers, what stands out. And a lot of it, honestly, is probably going to be just about how good these two guys are and how the Saints win no matter what. But we're going to break it down and get into the nuances over there. So I appreciate you very much, as always, y'all, for coming through for another episode of Locked on Saints. Coming up tomorrow, we're going to dive deeper into training camp. We're also going to take a look at how the New Orleans Saints revamping their running back room makes them look a little bit more familiar to previous running back rooms throughout New Orleans Saints history. We're going to take a look at that. And then we'll also, of course, bring you through everything that you might have missed from the week. And in case you missed it, getting you caught up on everything you need to know. Thanks again, family, for another fun episode and for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Appreciate you, as always, for making Locked on Saints a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi. And if you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're mom and them. And trust you, that nation.
I'll holla at you.